Welcome everyone, my name is David Ertl. I am the director of the N Plus One Institute. It's a new institute here on campus. Um, started in May, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but we're excited to partner with Google and kick off this uh, first ever reverse pitch competition here on campus. So thanks for coming out today. Uh, I just want to spend a minute to tell you about the N Plus One Institute. So like I said, we started in May. Um, this is an institute that's uh, that's created within Computer Data and Information Sciences, CDIS. And our goal is to bring industry in to do exciting things with our faculty researchers, uh, with our students, uh, and, and to create uh, an innovative environment for, uh, for projects and things like that that are centered around a few technologies, the most interesting new technologies uh, that you'll see up here. So um, edge computing, uh, is a focus area for us, and we brought on a partner, uh, GE Healthcare, uh, who we're doing some interesting projects with and uh, sponsoring things like our capstone course, um, as well as artificial intelligence and uh, next generation web technology. So those are three technology areas that we're focused on, and we're out working to bring in partners to do exciting things here on campus uh, in these three domains. You can find out more if you hit the QR codes in the back of the room on your way out. So uh, what is a reverse pitch competition? So if you're familiar with uh, startups, right? A lot of startups create an idea, they, they maybe build a prototype, and then they go out and try to find a sponsor, find someone who can invest in that company for them. Um, a reverse pitch competition is really just that. So in this case, uh, there's the CEO of Google uh, who is pitching uh, to an audience something that uh, he wants the audience to think about, contemplate, and bring good ideas back to him uh, to go work on. So the idea of a reverse pitch is, hey, let's start with a problem, you know, a real problem that's defined by an investor. Uh, let's, let's create an audience and an environment where people can respond to that and put together proposals and bring that back in and we'll select the best proposal and then move forward with that as a project. So, that's the idea. I can't promise that we're going to move forward with your project, uh, but there is uh, there are some really awesome prizes uh, for the best um, for the best of the best. Um, those will come later. So this is the first step. We're just kicking it off now, uh, and then we'll get into the actual competition in a little bit. Um, so what's at stake? So we have three one thousand dollars scholarships to the winning team. Uh, teams are three members each. So each member of that winning team will get a $1,000 scholarship. Uh, and then the runner-up team, each of those members will receive uh, a brand new Google Pixel 3 watch. Uh, and then the finalists, of which a total of six teams will be finalists, will each um, receive a set of Pixel Buds for each uh, student in the teams. So there's a lot of great prizes, thanks to our partner Google for showing up big. Uh, with the prizes to help motivate all of you. Uh, and that is what the awards will be. So um, that was just briefly the N Plus One Institute. I want to spend most of the time on what we're trying to accomplish and welcome our Google partners up to the stage. So come on up and we will hear directly from uh, Google what they're looking for and a little bit interesting background about each of them uh, to, to help us understand how you get from where you are uh, to where they are, so we'll close that gap. So welcome up Chris Doherty from, from Google. And you guys can self-introduce. Thank you so much, David, appreciate it. Yeah. Um, there's a team of eight of us here today from Google from pretty much all, not all over, but pretty widely scattered around from a Madison office to Minneapolis to Chicago to Atlanta. I think that's pretty much all the spaces from Cleveland. Sorry, I kind of forgot myself in there. So what we're going to do real quick is walk through a couple of the origin stories of how we came to the position here at Google. Anytime I'm on campus, and I spend a lot of time on campus, people ask me, like, how did you get to Google? How do I get to Google? I want to, I want to apply. I want to do these kind of things there. So um, Milo, come over here and take a seat for me real quick. Uh, and then I think the first person is actually me, funny enough. So this is the team that's here. You're going to hear from a couple of us. A couple of us are going to be long-term uh, conversations. So let's get started. How did this group come to Google? Um, born in California, Michigan raised, Midwestern through and through from a, from a raising standpoint. Three and a half years, moved, into, moved to Detroit. Um, I have five college transcripts in one bachelor's degree. That's not the way you're supposed to do it, 
right? You're supposed to have just one. I was a butterfly. I could not, and I still have not figured out what I want to do when I grow up. That's kind of my point. I literally learned skills in different colleges throughout and different jobs throughout to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, I failed my way to Google, pretty much straight and simple. I failed a lot. I failed at one job, failed at different schools, failed at different approaches, but I simply learned skills. I had experiences that led me through to successes over time. So what's Google looking for? They're looking for people that understand how to build ideas, how to do things, to fail, fail again, keep going through till success has really been the key. And so even now, the joke that everyone knows that works with me is like, you still haven't figured it out, have you? I'm like, nope, nope, haven't figured it out, and that's okay. I have friends that knew exactly what they wanted to do. They had a plan, they went to school, that plan they executed on, their RNs, their nurses, their doctors, that's fantastic. I myself could never figure it out, and that's okay too. That's what I tell my audiences. Listen, it's okay. Wherever you're at in your AI journey, wherever you're at in your schooling, continue to learn skills, experiences, failures and successes all together are really kind of the key. So my dream role, again, I don't know what that is yet. I've even told my bosses, I'm very honest about it. I'm like, I don't know exactly what I want to do next, but I'm ready to take a challenge on. I want to learn and I've got team skills, a team around me that wants to help me create success. That to me is the key. That's where I'm happiest, is when I've got a team around me that's ready to build great things, great products, great team, great outcomes across the board from that perspective there. So I want to let you know it's okay if you don't have a straightforward plan. If you fly a plane, you will not get directly to the location. You will slip and check back and forth till you land on that spot. So be, be assured that you can land on that spot eventually, however you want to get there. So next up is a good friend of mine, Joel. Want to come over here for a moment? And Joel has a fantastic background. We want to make sure we had a chance to share with you today. So. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Great to see you here. Um, so my background is a little different. As you can see, there's a lot of words on the slide. But I think w the key, what Chris was saying, is continuous learning. So as you're looking through, you know, I'm a generation of the gateway computer, the personal computer came out. I see some smiles in the background, back. Um, that was the first time kids actually had a device in their hands, which was parents maybe went and got them a gateway computer, the first, you know, shipped out of South Dakota very early on in the, the personal computer days. Um, and I, I used to play, you know, solitaire and a very basic game of pinball all the time as a kid. But I was always curious, like, how do all these things happen? But even as my journey kept going to being a computer lab assistant at the University of Iowa, which really was taking a floppy disk from somebody who didn't understand how to print, putting it in the computer and hitting print. Um, I was always interested in the why, but I never turned that into a computer science degree. I just kept going down the path of becoming a lawyer, which was my lifelong dream. Uh, and then as I started to realize in the practice of law, technology overlaid that quite a bit. And now at Google, to Chris's point, what Google is really looking for in individuals are people that are passionate about learning and putting yourself outside of your comfort zone. Because innovation is where that next generation is going. So whether it's you know, the AI model that you're thinking about or what's after AI. You know, five years ago, what AI looked like was just embedded in Google search and maybe a little bit of translate. But what does that mean 15 years from now? I don't think any of us know, but we're hoping this room comes up with that next idea. So again, thank you for being here and we really appreciate the partnership. Thank you, Joel, appreciate it. Next up, Charles, wanna come through? Uh, I, by the way, I filled out Charles' slide as a friend of his and a coworker, so none of it's correct, but that's okay. Charles will explain why. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, we tried to get Gemini to generate my profile, and it was wildly accurate, so we boiled it down to this. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so I am, <laughs> I am actually uh, from Atlanta. Um, I have a very untraditional sort of path or um, even set of recommendations in some respects to, to how to get to Google. Um, just to start off, I, I, I began my journey not in technology, but definitely in high school, really loved it. I just didn't see how to really pursue it kind of in, in the time when I was looking uh, to go to college. So I started off actually pursuing biology. Um, I'm a big, big fan of genomics and any kind of like deep biological research. Um, but I actually ended up leaving college uh, due to some kind of unforeseen circumstances um, and ended up uh, working at Emory University in Atlanta in the primate lab. Um, so anyone here by chance working in primate lab? Okay, good. Um, 
The, but uh, so sort of like found my way back into education uh, and since kind of joining Google, um, you know, I would say the journey's been kind of similar to what I experienced prior to joining, which is really, as Chris said, it's learning always, constantly trying to kind of find new ways of doing things and innovating. Um, and I would say when, you know, when the last couple of years since COVID, we've, we've sort of as a team thought about public sector and what it means to work in higher ed and helping uh, public sector customers. Um, I know oftentimes public sector kind of looks and smells and feels a lot like old legacy, but I can assure you there's a lot of really cool and interesting things happening. And of course, we, we see this in higher ed all the time. Um, but yeah, I, I think like the journey here has just been uh, awesome. And again, it's just been full of uh, trying to learn along the way and, and kind of break things and fix them. What, what's your role today? Oh, I'm a, I'm a, what should I say? That's why I asked. Okay. Uh, we've, I used to be called a field CTO. Uh, I'm now referred to as an industry architect. Um, and so, yeah. Specializing in what? Specializing in AI and machine learning uh, and big data and analytics. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Um, so unlike Chris, uh, when I was a junior in high school, I knew exactly what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, I wanted a career in the arts, and I was going to be a professional ballerina. Uh, clearly, that didn't work out. Um, <laughs> I actually got sick my junior year of high school, and I had to withdraw from school and dance for about six months. And my dad saw how bored I was at home trying to recover, um, and this was the mid-90s, so he signed us up for dial-up internet, and I was able to explore a whole new world of information. And it really just opened up my eyes to the possibilities that were outside of the career in the arts. Um, my dad was also really pleased because these careers were a lot more financially stable, uh, so he felt like he could retire one day. <laughs> so uh, I ended up getting an MIS degree from Texas Tech University, and I spent 15 or so years as a system administrator um, for small and large companies. I specialized in VMware and Citrix, um, and I really enjoy, to, even to this day, the technical parts of my work. I really enjoy them. Um, but I spent my nights and my weekends in a data center. It's very dark in there at night. The lights turn off on you um, unless you walk in front of the sensors. And it can be a little bit lonely is what I realized. Um, and even though I am an introvert, I did miss talking to people. I also missed daylight. So <laughs> I moved into a career in a customer facing role, similar to what I do now as a customer engineer at Google. And my work allows me to interact with our government and education customers, help them understand their needs and challenges, and translate those into solutions that Google can help them and partner with them to create. Um, that's how I ended up at Google. I've been here four and a half years. They haven't gotten rid of me quite yet. So thank y'all. Uh, so, again, we're kind of turning to folks that are all Minneapolis, Atlanta, Dallas, myself, and Cleveland, two more of the local flavor of folks that are here for you. So, Milo, why don't you come up and kind of describe who you are, and then we're going to transition to Tyler afterwards, and you'll kind of understand why Tyler's going to be here and kind of the explanation. So, thank you, Milo. Hello, everyone. It's uh, great to be here. Um, I have a degree from University of Wisconsin. I got my PhD here many years ago. And then uh, after graduating, I went off and I was a professor at, at Penn in Philadelphia for 10 years. But I missed Madison. And in the interim between when I'd left Madison and when I was looking to go on a sabbatical, um, they'd opened an office, a Google office in Madison. And uh, some of the people I knew from graduate school were some of the early employees there. Uh, one of them is actually here today. He was one of the first employees, uh, early employees at Google Madison. Um, so I came on sabbatical, and well, that was 10 years ago. Right? So I stayed, and I've really enjoyed being um, uh, here in Madison working for Google. The office has around 150 or so uh, engineers working on a lot of infrastructure-related things, storage, networking, databases, data analytics, AI, um, hardware for machine learning and AI, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, so my current role is that I'm the site lead of the site, which means I help sort of coordinate the site, as well as I, that's sort of my part-time thing, and then my full-time thing is I'm an engineering director working in the storage organization 
Um, anytime you upload an assignment to Google Classroom, you send a Gmail, you upload to YouTube, uh, that's underneath you know, using some of the systems that I'm responsible for um, that stores all the data. So uh, that's my introduction, and I'll come back a little later and talk a little bit about um, data centers and, and the pitch we're going to be asking you to, to think about. Tyler's going to come up next, and then we're going to transition to more of why are we here, what are we trying to accomplish, and then obviously the pitch will come up in a little bit. So thank you. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tyler Hebner, and um, unlike a lot of the folks you've heard from who work in Google Cloud or uh, in the storage itself, I actually work on energy at Google. Um, has anybody seen a newspaper article or read on the internet recently about data centers and artificial intelligence and how much energy they're going to use? Anybody seen an article like that recently? Okay, just about everybody. So we have a large team um, that works on energy issues at Google related to our data centers. I was born and raised uh, next door in Iowa in a small town. I went to the University of Iowa and I studied electrical engineering. Um, in Iowa, there's been wind turbines for a long time. There was a few at some schools. I remember distinctly playing a basketball game about an hour away from my house. I think I was in sixth grade and the school had a wind turbine. And I was always interested in that, but I went down the road of engineering and then um, it was kind of my senior year. I did a project on how could you make a golf cart solar powered. Um, and that kind of spun me out of the engineering track and into the energy track. I went to grad school at Stanford and then worked there in San Francisco for a couple of years. I moved across the country and worked for the US Department of Energy for two years. And then we came back to the Midwest. We didn't quite make it to Iowa. My wife chose Madison and we've been here uh, for the last 13 years. I worked for the state for a little bit. I ran a nonprofit organization that worked on renewable energy. And then I, uh, my most recent job before Google, I was appointed by the governor to be what's called a public service commissioner. Has anybody heard of a public service commission? Only one person who, if he's a student, he's a little bit of an older student. Um, so I worked at a state agency. This is an agency that oversees the electricity, natural gas, water, infrastructure, and what's called utility companies. And every single state has one, plus, plus DC too. I just joined Google here in June. And why I wanted to work at Google was because those data centers, our data centers need reliable 24-7 uh, you know, 99.9999% reliability plus. They need affordable energy because they use a lot, but Google, as I'm going to talk about, also has very ambitious goals to use carbon-free energy. So it was really a good mix of the work I'd done in the past and the expertise that I'd built up over my career. So I'm going to transition a little bit and talk about the energy story of Google and the data center story. So Today, Google has 28 um, data centers that are owned and operated by the company. So we have data centers on four different continents. Uh, most of them are in North America, some in Europe and some in Asia, one in South America. Um, and these have grown steadily over the years. As Milo uh, mentioned, he works on things like Google Search, uh, Gmail, YouTube, um, so Google's electric use and our resource use has grown um, about six-fold since from 2012 through 2023. And so you can kind of correlate that to how many times you've gone on YouTube last year versus how many times you did 10 years ago, right? Um, the amount of search, the amount of maps, we've obviously grown our products, et cetera. Um, Electricity use is somewhat of a proxy, too, of other resources, water use, et cetera, that, that Milo will talk a little, a little bit about. From an energy journey, though, we've recognized for a long time as a company um, that we want to be doing right by the world. Um, we understand climate change. We understand how the energy systems work. Um, we want to be a good corporate citizen and a good corporate actor. 
And so for a long time, we've been on a journey trying to figure out how we can not only minimize the impact that we have on energy use and the environment, but actually catalyze the solutions of tomorrow that are going to not only solve the problem for us as a company, but help solve the problem for society more broadly. And so in 2010, we started by signing an agreement with a wind farm that would help power a data center next door in Iowa, um, which is one of the largest data centers in the world in Council Bluffs, Iowa. Um, we steadily moved our way until 2017 when the amount of energy, electricity that we were using every year was being matched by wind farms and, and solar energy that we had contracted for and helped build that wouldn't have been built without our investment. Um, it was being matched throughout the year. So it didn't match up minute by minute, hour by hour, but throughout the whole year, the amount of data center energy use matched the production from wind and solar. In 2017, we, we hit that goal, um, but about three or four years ago, we recognized that what we really need to be doing is catalyzing um, the investments of the future, and not just sort of this mismatch of we get wind energy when it's windy, but our data centers are on all the time. So we set a new goal, which is um, to be what's called 24-7. So now we are looking to match every hour of energy use at the data centers with renewable or clean energy generation in that hour and then do it for the next hour and the next hour and the next hour throughout the whole year. We're currently at 64% of the hours of our data center usage are matched with clean energy throughout the world. And our goal is to be at 100% by 2030. This kind of tells that story about how we started with no renewable energy and then we steadily made our way by 2017 to 100% matching. But our electric use continues to grow. Um, and so we continue to sign more and more contracts. And now we're looking to catalyze new technologies, as I said. One of the coolest projects we've been working on is a geothermal energy project in Nevada where we would basically buy all of the energy out of this geothermal plant that is able to produce clean energy around the clock. So that's kind of the energy story and my expertise, and now I'm gonna pass it over to Milo to talk more broadly about environmental. Thanks, Tyler. So energy uh, is one of the biggest components of the environmental impact that Google has. And things we're gonna be asking you to think about in this, this pitch, this is your first pitch. But I also want to emphasize that it's not the only environmental impact, so I want to encourage you to think broadly about the impact. So this is uh, a slide from Google's 2024 environmental report. You can find it by searching on Google, uh, or there's a URL here. But I want to highlight a couple of things in here to sort of broaden, in addition to the very important piece that's electricity, some of the other aspects about environmental impacts that we want to find creative solutions for. So, when we're talking about our operations, there's the net zero carbon, there's also about water and land use, there's what's called circular economy, which I'll talk about in a little bit, as well as nature and biodiversity. So you can look at this report, this is a slide from the report that kind of talks about some of these aspects of the environmental impact that Google's working actively to address. So I look, it breaks down the report, like of all these different sort of scope of uh, where the energy and where the environmental impact's coming from, uh, the hardware they purchase, we purchase, the energy we consume to run that hardware, the data centers we build, how that all kind of breaks down and adds up together to the environmental footprint. So I mentioned water stewardship, it's, it's a big issue. Uh, many of our data centers are water cooled and we wanna look at ways of reducing our water consumption as well. Here's an example of some work we're doing in that space. Just again, kind of give you a flavor to think about some of the things when looking at the, at the pitch, which I'll get to here in a moment. Circular economy really is about the entire supply chain. So we buy hardware, it eventually becomes obsolete where the energy it takes to run it uh, versus what you're getting out of it is no longer like energy environmentally or cost effective. So then how do you take that used hardware and make sure it gets reused, recycled, et cetera, you know, 
uh, most productively. So we actually have worked with some of our vendors to make sure that they can, uh, they have the expertise in what they built us and how they can reuse those or remanufacture or that kind of thing. So that's also a big port, important piece, uh, the, the whole life cycle of the data center. So that's the environmental report. I just wanted to highlight a couple of things from there for you to think about. I also wanted to mention a little bit about another big initiative that Google has done. It has like a Madison connection, so I wanted to share it as well, which is that Google builds its own custom hardware for AI ML. So this is uh, the tensor processor unit that Google designs and builds and then someone manufactures uh, and fabricates for us. Um, there was a paper published about this. This here, you can see it's actually liquid cooled. This is one of the, the, the further generations of, of this hardware. There's actually been a whole generation, there's many generations over the last 10 years, starting out over 10 years ago uh, when the projects first started. And one thing that isn't very well known is that this project originally was Skunk Works here in the Madison office. It was people in the Madison office working with others across Google that said, hey, this machine learning AI thing is gonna be big someday. We, you know, this is even in the, in the context of like um, translating speech and text and, and that kind of AI. Um, we're gonna need a lot of ways to do it very efficiently. And having a special purpose piece of hardware is much more efficient for doing that than if you have a general purpose uh, CPU. So of course NVIDIA also sells a lot of hardware these days that's specialized for it, but Google has been for the last 10 years working on this. And so though we do also purchase NVIDIA chips for cloud and other things, we have a huge advantage in terms of efficiency and capability by having our own chips we've been investing in for over a decade. And Madison played a big role, big role. still does. The other thing I wanna point out here before I get to the pitch is Large language models are, of course, front and center for everybody, but it's not the only thing that AI ML does. This is from a couple of years ago. This is a project out of DeepMind, Google's sort of AI branch, um, called AlphaFold. It is a protein folding uh, project. Protein folding is basically taking a DNA description and then predicting what molecule will form from that, uh, what shape, how it will bind, and they used deep learning to uh, take these protein folding challenge problems and did better than any other system out there. So it was given this you know, big award, it was considered a landmark discovery, this is an article in Nature, it got a lot of um, uh, you know, rightful praise for doing this deep work that could influence drug discovery, they've um, taken a bunch of proteins, folded them and put that information out publicly. There's been a lot of good work here in AI ML that is not just large language models as well. Okay. I should say the Madison office has a connection to this as well, because one of our in-memory distributed file systems was used internally to help sort of serve data to do this training. Okay, so what you've all been waiting for is the actual pitch. What are we asking you to think about? How this is gonna work? So the goal here is to source from you all new ideas, create dialogue related to the world, this worldwide problem, and build a connection between Google and the campus. Okay, so kind of a boilerplate thing here. Digital age has transformed the way we live, work, and interact, but the environmental impact of cloud and AI data centers that power our online world is, a, is growing and a growing concern. As the demand for data storage and processing continues to surge, the environmental footprint associated with these data centers poses a significant challenge to achieving our global sustainability goals. So what are we asking? We're asking students, you all from University of Wisconsin-Madison, to propose innovative solutions to reduce the environmental impact of cloud and AI data centers, including one or more of the following aspects of the entire data center lifecycle. Starting with the construction of the data center, and then obtaining the data center compute AI and storage hardware, and the manufacture of those you know, by the suppliers. So this is all the supply chain manufacturing. Operating the data centers, including the energy, needed to run the computers, the energy and resources needed to cool it, water use, efficient use of deployed hardware, how do we get the most out of a data center once it's built? And then the whole lifetime. Well, how would you manage the final, you know, the longevity of the data center, decommissioning it, um, and the circular economy I mentioned earlier about making sure that that hardware that's obsolete now gets repurposed the best way. So you don't have to cover all of these things, but we're looking for innovative, interesting, um, yet practical ideas in this overall space 
tackling one or more of these things. And we really encourage you also to think about cross-stack, cross-layer, interdisciplinary approaches. And that's often where a lot of these really big breakthroughs can come from. Instead of just having it siloed to each individual layer, think about how you can optimize across the layers to really build a more efficient system, where a system has a, a, a different kind of environmental impact. Okay, so that is what we are asking you to think about. And I will hand it back over for the, uh, the final uh, logistics of the pitch. All right, so how do you compete? So there's a minimum, uh, there's, a, there's a three person team that we're asking you to form for each team that submits. Um, and you would submit a proposal that addresses one of the things um, that Milo was talking about just before. This is all published on our website, should be live now. And I'll get you a QR code to link to the website when we're finished here. Um, and there's some recommendations. So basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna form a team of three people you're gonna brainstorm on what would be a, a creative, innovative solution to one of these problems. You're gonna to put together a proposal that discusses that and then submit it in for the competition. Um, so recommend it. So problem analysis and solution. We wanna see that you have a firm understanding of what the problem is, okay? So you could do some analysis on, on that to find out some of the facts and figures about the scope of the problem. Um, and also with your proposed solution. So you know, include the, the scope of your solution, what's it gonna cover, how much of an increase in efficiency or um, uh, decrease in, in waste or uh, increase in, in impact to the environment are you going to create with your solution. Um, information on your team so we know who you are and what your background is. Milo mentioned interdisciplinary, so you know, grab some of your fellow students from a different major across campus and put your heads together and see what you can come up with. Uh, project sustainability, something uh, that's very important, which is, um, you know, you don't want to spend a lot of money one time, get a quick benefit from it, and then be done. You want that project to sustain itself so that it can continue to give those benefits over time. So think about project sustainability. How is that project going to be sustained over time? Um, any of the key dependencies that that solution might have, as well as key partners that would need to come together to do this. And remember, we're talking about the data center here, you know, essentially, but we're talking about data centers globally, right? So think, you know, there's, here's the freedom and the flexibility to think big, right? Um, and then what are the impacts? What do you expect that this solution would do, uh, either for the environment or for the data center efficiency um, or other, other kinds of residual benefits? So that's uh, just some recommended things you don't have to uh, there's not categories for those, but that's what we'll be looking for in the proposals to see that you've uh, put together a, a good, thorough proposal. How do you win? So, uh, A, you showed up today, that's great. Uh, that's the first step. Um, after you submit proposals, uh, a group will go through those proposals and they will select six of those proposals to compete uh, in, in the final of the competition. Um, so those six finalist teams will then be invited on November 6th to present your solutions to a panel of judges, and the judges will score uh, those proposals, and from them they will select the winning proposal, uh, the runner-up proposal, and then all the rest. Um, so that, that is how the competitions run. Uh, key deadlines, one week from today. So one week from today, your team must be registered in order to compete. Uh, so there's, there's registration of your team and then there's proposal submission. Those are two separate deadlines, so make sure that you have your team registered within a week. That allows us to know how many teams will be competing so we can prepare everything uh, for how the judges will score things, okay? So if you miss the deadline, uh, we will not accept your, your proposal. That's a key date. Uh, and then of course, you know, develop your proposal over the next, the coming three weeks. Uh, and submit those by the due date. So again, late proposals will not be accepted. Um, then on October 30th, uh, the finalists, that group of six, will be notified um, from our office and you'll have roughly a week uh, to put together a presentation of your proposal. So you might wanna already think about your, present, your final presentation as you're developing your proposal because it's a pretty short time frame. 
uh, to when you would come back in and present. So those are the key deadlines. Um, I did mention earlier that it is a three-page proposal. So um, you have up to three pages to talk about the kinds of things you want to talk about. And, um, but it only three pages PDF format. There's lots of information about um, how you do things uh, to, to, to go with uh, the rules of the competition. And those can be found um, on the following website QR. So, uh, link, so co connect to this and then you will see a landing page for, uh, for the whole competition that covers all of the rules, all the terms and conditions of, 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 of competing. Um, it gives the prizes uh, overview um, and, and uh, all the details about how you submit proposals, exactly how to do that um, on, those, on those official rules. So with that, uh, that's the end of our formal presentation for today. Um, thanks for coming out. I hope you enjoyed uh, the, this, the talk from our friends at Google who've come here to sponsor this for us. We really look forward to seeing what you guys can come up with. Uh, we're counting on you as our, our next generation best and brightest uh, to put your heads together and think of some really innovative solutions to these, these real challenges that, that you know, companies like Google and, and, and many, many other uh, companies who are creating data centers and, and driving forward the advancements that we're seeing in AI are faced with. So, uh, so this, is, uh, this is your chance to shine. So with that, um, thank you, Google, for coming today all the folks here, and they'll be available in the back of the room uh, for people to talk to and ask questions. But that's all for today. Thanks, everyone.